Hey, Campfire Crew, let's get it on. Bad Feeling Saved My Life by Responsible Carpet. My name is Christopher. I'm a high school student in my first year, and I'm 16 years old. This story took place during the second week of Easter vacation in 2023, when I was 15. I want to mention that it happened in my mother's house. At that time, my mother had decided to renovate the kitchen because it was really outdated. So there was this blonde guy with blue eyes who came to start the work, which involved putting up plastic sheets on the walls and a divider in my living room, which is next to the kitchen. At the end of that first day, I had to go to the dentist to pick up a dental impression, and my mother had informed the worker that we would be back in an hour and a half. However, since the appointment was to just pick up an item, we returned in only 45 minutes. On the way back, my mother suggested getting kebabs and doing a good deed by dropping off the worker at the train station. So when I returned to offer him a ride to the station, I noticed he was very uneasy with a nervous smile as if to say everything was fine. I insisted that he come with us, and he agreed. And along the way, he explained that his name was Brian. I'm changing his name for anonymity. And that he was originally from Moldova. He also mentioned that he lived alone in Paris, but had two children living in his home country. We arrived at the station, dropped him off, grabbed our kebabs, and went home. After I finished eating, I decided to take a bath, as I love doing that all the time. However, to my dismay, the water turned from hot to cold. So I spent two hours in lukewarm water, then got out and returned to my upstairs room. Immediately upon opening the door, I noticed that my PC was open and turned on to my locked screen wallpaper, even though I distinctly remember closing it before going downstairs for my bath. I asked my mother if she had been in my room or touched my PC, and she said no, she had stayed in her room watching the news. After a quick search of my room turned up nothing, I finally decided to go to sleep. But at 5 a.m., I woke up sweating and shivering intensely, which had never happened to me before. I had a feeling of danger and that something or someone was nearby. So I grabbed a knife because, yes, it's a bit scary, but I have a passion for edged weapons, probably from manga, and I have a collection of knives, katanas, and shuriken on my bedroom wall. With the knife, I searched my room again, but found nothing. However, the feeling didn't go away, so I locked my door and messaged my mother to see if she was awake and had the same feeling, but she didn't respond. I waited for three hours until I heard her walking in her room. She came to see me, and I explained what had happened that night, and she told me I was probably just being paranoid and that everything was fine. She also warned me that Brian would arrive around 10 a.m. to continue the work, and that since she would be leaving for work, I would be alone with him. She assured me that I wouldn't need to go downstairs to let him in because she had told him she always kept the keys in a woodshed next to the door. She then went to work, and I went back to sleep, locking my door. I woke up at 11.30 that morning and went downstairs to make food in the basement because the kitchen was under construction. When I didn't find Brian down there, I didn't think much of it. I went back upstairs, and I ran into him. As soon as I saw him, that bad feeling returned, but he started talking to me. I tried to end the conversation and quickly went back to my locked room. Ten minutes later... Brian knocked on my door, asking for help carrying something. I didn't respond because I really didn't want to see him again. But he started trying to open the door and began kicking it hard. So my first instinct was to grab a knife, lock myself in my bathroom, which is in my room, and call the police. I explained in a panic what was happening, and the woman on the line said she was sending two cars, which would arrive in ten minutes. While waiting, Brian managed to enter my room and began breaking down the bathroom door. I told him I'd called the police and that they'd be arriving any minute, that I was armed with a knife, and that I wouldn't hesitate to use it. 
Upon hearing this, he stopped banging on the door and left. The police arrived and caught Brian as he was trying to flee, and my mother immediately came home, saw me, and burst into tears, telling me she should have listened to me. A few days later, the police called to explain that Brian was wanted for kidnapping, identity theft, torture, and murder. I believe that bad feeling I had during the night was him returning and hiding outside of my room in the house because he knew where the spare keys were hidden. Now he's in prison, and I hope to never see him again. It's amazing how our instincts can be useful, and I'm glad I was able to lock my door because previously I couldn't, as I didn't have a key. I also think my weird passion for knives because I don't know if Brian would have left if I hadn't mentioned it and especially thanks to the police, who arrived so quickly and caught him. Trippy Camping by Anonymous A few years back, I decided to go camping with about ten other friends at Snively Hot Springs in eastern Oregon on Friday the 13th. It was also a full moon. The trip was only a little over an hour, and I had to work the next day, so I decided I wasn't going to drink much. I didn't want to be hung over in the morning. We arrived, set up camp in a lovely spot away from everyone else, drank a little, and then headed to the springs where we had an amazing time together. Laughing, smiling, and making best friend soup while watching the sunset. Truly one of the most lovely experiences of my life. The majority of us decided we wanted to go on a night walk and enjoy the mountains illuminated by the full moon and stars. We headed back to camp and put on some warm clothes and started to get ready to head out. Well, half of us were ready to go and the other half were lollygagging around. Some of them drunk, high, and distracted, so overall it was actually pretty difficult to get all of us in a spot where we were ready to go. It was really dark at this point and people dipped out so only a few of us ended up actually going on this night walk. Side note, the three of us that had went all had been microdosing mushrooms pretty much the majority of the night. Things were slightly trippy, but I didn't get super glonky and or unaware of my surroundings. It was three of us, myself, my friend girl, and my friend boy, and friend boy's dog. We did have a flashlight, but most definitely should have had a headlamp for all of us. We were walking uphill for about ten minutes, and we took a right onto a trail. And in front of the trail, though, was a cattle guard, a.k.a. a stock grid. We picked up the dog and crossed it and started walking on the trail. The cattle guard adjacent to a couple of barbed wire fences should have been the very first sign to not cross it, but we crossed it anyway. We didn't even make it three minutes without hearing some very loud, close-by rustling in front of us. We stopped in our tracks, and Homeboy in the front of the line started scanning the area with his flashlight. Have you ever seen a cat's eyes in the dark? The way they glow is chilling, especially when the cat is bigger than you. So, there we were, face to face with a big old mountain lion. It wasn't more than a few yards in front of us. Instinct kicked in for all of us, and we just backed away slowly. We backed away, backed away, backed away. The dog, on the other hand, had an instinct of its own and ran off to the side. We could see her running alongside of us, but a couple of yards away. (laughs) We backed away until we couldn't back away anymore and hit the barbed wire fence. Sure enough, we saw the dog was right next to us. So what was that running alongside of us? We shined the flashlight, and holy shit, another mountain lion. How lucky we were to run into Mama and Baby together. On the other side of the fence was someone else's campsite. We had no choice but to turn around and jump it. We got the dog over first, and then jumped it and ripped all of our clothing in the process, and friend boy cut his leg pretty badly. So now we're in someone else's campsite, on Friday the 13th, under a full moon, in the mountains, tripping on mushrooms, and completely lost. We didn't know where the people were, but we didn't care. 
We got into their unlocked car and honked the horn for about a minute to scare off the cougars. We made sure to clearly yell and let any and everybody around us know that we weren't robbers and that there were cougars close by. We got out after a couple of minutes and were pretty weirded out that nobody came to check on their campsite. My friend girl swore she could hear someone screaming or trying to scream, but her boyfriend insisted that we needed to leave the campsite. Part of me believed her even though I didn't hear any noises, but I was also ready to get the fuck away from that area. We found the exit of their campsite, and on the way back to ours, I said my final prayers. I'm not even religious. We got back to camp, and every rustling noise around me had me convinced that we were being stalked by these cougars. I had a full-fledged panic attack in the car for about an hour and was absolutely covered in gnats because the sunroof was cracked. Everyone else was having fun around the campfire, even the other two who had just gone through the same experience I did. Friend girl got in the car with me and got herself covered in bugs just to help me out of my sheer panic. She brought a bottle of tequila and a pocket full of mushrooms and told me that we'd die happy together if we died tonight, and I gained enough courage to get out of the car and go have some fun with my friends. I was hung over as shit the next day, and no called no showed my job and got fired when I got back into town. It was worth every second, but holy shit was I traumatized. Sometimes I even have nightmares about those cougars stalking me still. So, a word of advice. Don't scale a mountain at night in a place native to large wildcats. Or you do you. You only live once. Thinking about what could have been happening at the other campsite still chills me to my core all the time. Friend girl and I aren't in touch anymore. But I wonder if what happened that night still keeps her up at night, too. Something Strange on the Golf Course by Anonymous When I was 17, I worked as a busboy at a high-end country club restaurant. It was the sort of place where people paid all-inclusive yearly memberships, and they could roll into the restaurant after nine holes, stuff their faces and get wasted, and head back out for more grass hockey. Anyway, policy was that the restaurant closed whenever the members were finished. This could mean that you could get to leave at 9 p.m. or 2 a.m. Depending on which members were hanging out, this could mean some late nights. One of the fun parts of the job was hopping onto one of the staff carts and driving around the course to restock all the snack shacks. These were the little stalls that had soda, chocolates, and other miscellaneous crap you could jam into your face while watching a buddy age stroke deep in a bunker. Late one night, after a wedding reception and after we fed and shot the shit with the band, I got snack duty. Everyone else was busting ass on cleanup and next day prep, so I went solo. I was stoked. It was accepted practice to nab a couple of beers for oneself when doing the rounds. So I hopped onto a cart and headed out onto the course. It was getting close to 3 a.m. at that point. And I'm not sure if you've been out on an unlit golf course at 3 a.m., but it's a little surreal. It's not like you're in the wild. Everything is smooth lines and picturesque, but you're far away from fucking anything. Lots of fencing is up to keep critters and people out, too. And I've never really had any concerns at all being out there late at night. Except this time, I'm at hole number six, heading up to the snack shack. It's kind of like a porta potty sized pantry. I was in the golf cart when the door slammed shut. Before I could really react, someone screamed from inside, I will fucking kill you. I lost my shit and beelined it back to the restaurant at the cart's top speed, shitting bricks and attempting not to think about getting shot in the back. By the time I got back, I'd convinced myself that it was a prank and everyone was going to be laughing at me. But my boss saw my face, and I told him what happened. He told me only a couple of people haven't clocked out, so it wasn't staff. The police came out and took a statement and searched the shack. All the food and soda was gone. The interior was plastered with shit and blood, random letters on the walls. 
they found a hole dug under the perimeter fence. I stopped doing night runs to the snack shacks after that. They tore that one down. To this day, I can't see anything golf without thinking about hole number six and who was out there. Creepy Man Watching Me Babysit by Ikea's Lover 3000 Before I start, I must say I haven't told many people this. This happened in Kelowna, Canada in the 80s. I was about 14 and was babysitting in a neighbor's house while the parents were gone. They had a nice house, like most in the neighborhood, and it was right on the corner where two streets connected. My house was right outside a bus stop across from theirs. This happened pretty late at night in the winter, so it was dark out, maybe 11 or 12. I was sitting on the couch when I thought I saw something out the back door. It was one of those glass doors that led to the porch. It was weird, though, because I really couldn't see much. You know, when the lights are on and it's dark out so you can't see anything but black in your reflection? Well, that's what I saw. But I could have sworn it looked like something was there. So I got up and walked close to the window. It definitely looked like something was there, but I still couldn't see. I got closer. Still couldn't see. I honestly should have just turned on the lights, but instead I put my face right up to the glass and cut my hands by my eyes to look out. Maybe one inch from my face, on the other side of the glass, was a man. He looked tall and pale from what I could see, and he was staring at me very scarily. Keep in mind, he would have been watching me from the backyard. Naturally, I jumped back and let out a short scream, but stupid teenage me didn't call the cops. I called my parents instead. My father came over to take a look, and there were still footprints in the front yard and backyard. I don't remember much after that, but it just all felt like a very unreal experience. You never expect this stuff to happen to you until it does, but... Anyways, I hope you enjoyed this short story, because I sure didn't enjoy experiencing it. Was This a Human or Something Else? by Your Mom Zaho. This happened around six years ago, but I still constantly think about it. Me, an 11-year-old female, and my two friends, I'll call them E and S, E11 and S13, were planning on spending the night in a tent in my backyard. I lived in the middle of nowhere on four acres of land that has a two-acre opening surrounded by rows of trees. We set up a campfire right in the middle of the opening and sat around it for a couple of hours just hanging out and talking. My dog, Fly High Chester, you were a good boy, growled and barked a couple of times, but to be honest, I didn't think much of it since I felt safe on my own yard, and Chester always barked at random things. We got tired and decided to hop into the tent and watch a movie before going to sleep. By the time the movie ended, it was around 2 a.m., and we all decided it was time to go to bed. Chester started barking, and yet again, I just ignored it. And looking back, the amount of times he barked wasn't normal. S was already asleep, and I was starting to drift off, and E was still awake, when someone outside tripped over the tent's rope line and fell on top of my head since I was in the corner of the tent. I was so tired and half asleep, somehow it didn't startle me or even register in my brain properly. I just thought maybe it was my dad checking up on us to make sure we were okay. This thing or whoever got up, walked to the front of the tent, and unzipped it slowly. Something inside of me told me to pretend to be asleep and not to look. The door stayed unzipped for about a minute or two before it got zipped back up and the person walked away. My friend E woke me up terrified, asking who the fuck it was, and I told her it was probably just my dad checking up on us, and to just go back to sleep. She told me it didn't look like him, and I thought she was just paranoid because we did just watch a horror movie. I really wish I would have listened, but I just wasn't scared. 
In the morning, we all went inside to eat breakfast with my family, so naturally I brought up my dad tripping over the tent rope last night and hitting my head, just to tease him because I found it funny. He looked at me confused and said he had never gone outside to check up on us. I got a little scared, but then I thought maybe it was just my older brother messing with us. But it turns out he was at a friend's house that night. So I asked my friend exactly what she saw. She said she was also pretending to be asleep, but she did peek at the door for a moment and saw something with a long beard and big ears staring in at us. The weirdest thing is that we never heard a vehicle or anything come by. So how did this person get all the way to my house? We still have no idea who or what it was, and it freaks me out. I believe it wasn't my dad, because he would never scare us like that. And if he did, he would have told us it was him right after. I don't know why the thing only stared at us and did nothing else, but I'm so thankful nothing terrible did happen. I mean, who knows? Maybe if we didn't pretend to be sleeping, things could have gone very wrong. We were three young girls sleeping alone in a tent, after all. Safe to say... There were no more backyard sleepovers for me, and I learned that I have no survival instincts. Creepy Ex-Boyfriend by Don't Talk to the Cops Hey all, female here. I'm not looking for advice, I just want to share my story. Many years back, I dated a man-child, relatively the same age as myself. We got along quite well. He presented gentlemanly, hospitable, kind, and loving. In hindsight, things escalated quite quickly. We went from being friends to being exclusive within a month. Not enough time to truly know someone. We saw each other daily, and we mostly hung out at his home. That was fine with me in the beginning, as I'm rather introverted couple months into our relationship, I started to question why we weren't leaving the house, why we weren't going out and experiencing new things and trying out new hobbies. His responses were always cloudy. He always tried to redirect the conversation, thinking I was truly stupid and couldn't tell that this was an obvious avoidance tactic. That was the point where I started to become curious, and from there it went downhill. I'm not an intrusive person, but considering he was my partner, I had a right to inquire as to why we were isolating ourselves. After some mild questioning for a few weeks, I noticed he began to create distance. This noticeable change was hard to ignore and pretty much confirmed my suspicions. However, I wasn't going to make a decision based on assumptions. I'm ashamed to admit this, but one night while he was sleeping, I went through his phone. I still feel disgusting, even though I found 100% proof that I was the side chick. I couldn't believe it. I still can't. I was with this person daily. It obviously confirmed why we were so confined to his home. But it was perplexing because she had no idea about me. It was about 2 a.m. when I looked through his phone. There was no way I could sleep beside him for the remainder of the morning, so I quietly got out of bed, collected my things, and went home. The next day, I believe he realized what had happened. However, he never contacted me to see why I left. Things remained silent for the entire day, and then I received a phone call later that evening. I confronted him. Again, I'm ashamed to say that I did take photos of the evidence as I knew he would try to gaslight me. The fury in his voice was palpable. He did what a usual abuser would do and blamed me for going through his phone while totally ignoring his infidelity. It was pathetic. He had created this delusion that I was going to contact the other girlfriend and tell her all his wrongdoings, all his infidelity, lying, cheating, etc., I would have done this, however, while I was looking through the phone, I realized that this girl was very sheltered. She was completely oblivious of what was going on. I was afraid he would retaliate against myself and her, and thought to myself that eventually she would find out. I do regret not informing her, however, my decision was my decision and I can't change that. 
But this is where my nightmare began. He was so paranoid and confident that I was going to contact his girlfriend that he would constantly call me and make vague threats. I persistently advised him that I would not contact her, that it was none of my business, and that she would eventually find out that he was a deceitful, inept brainworm sooner or later. All I wanted was for him to fuck off, leave me alone, and never speak to me again. It was my only request. He obviously didn't take my kind words well, and he continued to harass me. Only a few days later, things completely erupted. His paranoia exceeded levels I have never seen before. He sent me a threatening message saying he had compromising photos of me and he would release them. He believed that I would ruin his relationship and I couldn't believe his delusion. No matter what I said, no matter how I phrased it, I even had my mom speak with him at one point. It was useless. I sent him a message stating that if it was true that he did have those photos, and if he messaged me again, I was going to call the cops. Five minutes later, I received 11 messages in succession. A few were videos, photos, and personalized animations of me. I'd never seen these images, videos, and animations before. They were taken without my consent, and they were extremely intimate and compromising. Unbeknownst to me, he had cameras set up around his room. These weren't just threats. These were screenshots of these images, videos, and animations uploaded on various sharing sites. Luckily, he lacked intelligence. I mean, he sent me the evidence. There was nothing I could do to stop the uploads, but I immediately went to the police. They did manage to take some down. However, there were no promises, as once a photo was uploaded... It's immediately archived. This has forever altered my life. I don't see relationships the same. I can't be intimate. I can't form strong bonds. I become apathetic, and I'm forensically observant. And I have difficulty trusting everyone, even my family, and so much more. The police were rather efficient and treated me well, and I was granted an immediate protection order and a family violence order. He broke that quite quickly and called my phone trying his best to apologize, begging me to drop the charges. He is so pathetic that he got his mummy to ring me and tried to get her to persuade me too. I immediately called the police and they took immediate action. This ended up going to court. I won. It's not the result that I wanted. However, he did get his name on that good old sex offenders registry which is far more egregious than people may think. Nevertheless, this is beyond life-changing. To all who have gone through this, I'm sorry and I feel your pain. Be careful around the people you think you trust. I know that's quite nihilistic and pessimistic, but these are some of the unfortunate aspects of life. It's quite paradoxical. Humans are social creatures, but many humans are pure rat shit. Scumbags at the Trailer Park by Anonymous I'm a security guard that works at an RV lot in Florida. It's one of those resorts where the snowbirds flock to during the wintertime. That basically means all the retired folks come down from up north and spend a good part of the winter season here in Florida. Working on armed security, despite all the things you may have heard, is not easy. You have to deal with very rude morons from time to time. And when that happens, the paperwork piles up. In my case, being a skinny pushover did not make my job any easier. Poor me. One of my scariest encounters with individuals who pretty much thought they could get away with trespassing on private property and stealing shit occurred during the summer of 2013. I hope you understand that I'm not comfortable in sharing any information regarding this occurrence because I really don't like the idea of random people knowing where I work. This incident occurred around 2.45 a.m. It was a really hot summer night and the resort was pretty much vacant except for a few residents since it was the off-season. Quick side note, the resort I work at has only one point of entry and exit. The rest of the perimeter was fenced off. 
So basically, I would have to watch the resort entrance for about 30 minutes, then do a street patrol on my golf cart for about 30 minutes, then go back to watching the entrance again. The cycle repeats itself for about 8 hours. Pretty simple. However, on this night, there was trouble coming my way. As I said before, it was about 2.45 a.m., when three suspicious Caucasian males wearing baggy white t-shirts and low-rider shorts emerged from the public road just outside the entrance and then entered the resort. I immediately pointed my flashlight at them, and I was instantly unnerved by the sight of red bandanas covering their faces. I aimed the beam of light directly at one of them and said, Hey, this is private property. I'm going to have to ask you guys to leave. They didn't pay any attention to my presence. They just kept advancing into the resort. I pulled out my golf cart onto the street from my parking spot and again said, Hey, you guys can't be here. You're trespassing on private property. One of the slim shady clones turned to me and said, Go fuck yourself, pussy. At that moment, I realized these dudes were not interested in leaving the resort and that they were most likely here to ransack one of the unoccupied mobile homes. I watched as they walked down one of the resort streets and disappeared into the maze of RV and mobile home units. I didn't pursue them. These guys looked to be in their 20s, and even though they were wearing baggy clothes, I could tell these guys were much bigger than me. Plus, I wasn't armed. I did know that if these guys were packing heat, I was not paid enough to be a hero. So I pulled out my cell phone and called the cops. While I was on the phone with the police, I nervously kept glancing around, and as I stated earlier, there's only one exit to this place, and I was right next to it because I didn't think driving around a resort playing cat and mouse with three physically superior males looking for trouble was the best idea. They could be hiding anywhere out there, and even if I did confront them, it would still be three-on-one. But at the same time, it was unlikely that they would jump the fence because of the protective barbed wire around the fencing. So if they did decide to exit the resort, it would take them right past where I was. The police operator mentioned that they were looking for these guys. Apparently, they had done something prior to entering my resort, and the police operator instructed me to sit tight and the police would be arriving soon. After she got done telling me that, I saw the three thugs appear from behind a nearby unit. They started walking in my direction, and I heard one of them say, I think this pussy just called the cops on us. Let's beat his ass before the pigs show up. After that was said, the three started running full speed towards me, and I took off down another resort street, hoping that they would just leave through the exit. But to my horror... I looked back and saw the three thugs tailing my golf cart. The golf cart is pretty old and doesn't go that fast, plus the battery wasn't to its full capacity since I was more than halfway into my shift. I fucking floored it and could hear the three behind me shouting obscenities and threats. I feared for my life as I raced down the street. I mean, I didn't know what would happen to me if these guys caught up with me. I was about to reach the end of the street and turn the corner when I saw red and blue rays of light coming from behind me. I managed to look behind me one last time before cutting the corner. Three police cruisers were coming down the road towards the three slim shadies and me. One of the intruders shouted, Oh, shit! And like true gangsters, the three took off into an alley that was between two nearby units located on the opposite side of the street from the corner I was about to turn onto. I turned the corner and stopped my golf cart. My heart was about to pop out of my chest. Shortly after I stopped my cart, a police car emerged from the street that was parallel to where the chase took place. Now keep in mind that this all went down in the middle of the property. The officer pulled next to me and asked if I was okay, and I said I was. And as soon as I said that, we heard what sounded like a shouting match between the thugs and the other cops that were in the resort. It sounded like it was coming from somewhere close by. I also heard what sounded like someone being slammed against the hood of a car. And I've never heard the word fuck being shouted out loud so many times. I later found out that these guys were wanted for arson. Before they paid me a visit that night, they torched two units to the ground at a neighboring resort. 
They also set a car on fire while they were there. I consider myself very lucky to have come out of this situation without a scratch. If the cops hadn't shown up when they did, I probably would have been pulverized by that trio. I had the chance to testify against them in court, but I opted not to. They had more than enough charges to put them away for a very long time, even without my testimony. But I'll never forget that night. Many of the residents thanked me for my actions, but honestly, all I did was call the cops like anyone else would. But I did appreciate their brief admiration. So, to the three Slim Shady clone gang members, let's not meet again. Hey gang, thanks for listening to this episode of Uncle Josh's True Scary Stories. If you have a true scary story of any nature that you'd like to hear narrated on my channel or podcast, email it to Uncle Josh True Scary Stories at gmail.com. I read them all. Please like, share, and subscribe to this channel, and leave a comment below. I'll get back to you as quickly as I can. I love reading the comments. Let me know what you thought of the stories. Follow me on social media, there's links for that in the description. And if you'd like to step up your support of the channel, find my Patreon link and a link to my Tee Public storefront in the description as well. I hope everyone is doing well. Everyone, be excellent to each other. And until next time, be wary of things that go bump in the night. It could be anything. A ghost, a monster, or the guy next door.